All right. Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Dylan Stafford. I'm an assistant dean within the UCLA Anderson School of Management. I have been here at UCLA. This is my 18th year. I have known Dr. Cooper since uh, 2015 when I looked her up in the UCLA directory and said, hey, can we be professional buddies? Would you be my friend? And I say that silly, but it's not silly. Um, Dr. Cooper is an incredible leader and she's a force to be reckoned with and she's got a voice and her commitment is that all children in foster care in the United States are treated with dignity and respect that we can really make that system work. And whether you know anything about that system or not, Historically, it's a system with challenges, and uh, some populations have even higher challenges than others. And Kush is committed that um, LGBTQ children in foster care um, have a system that works for them, as well as, as all children in that system. And uh, what started out as a monthly coffee has turned into a five-year professional friendship. And with Dr. Cooper, we've hosted over 200 faculty from six continents here to UCLA the last two summers to uh, do an intensive six day, 50 hour uh, experience called Being a Leader in the Effective Exercise of Leadership, an ontological phenomenological model. What you're gonna do tonight is not 50 hours of content, so please relax, but know that the content that we are excerpting from is some of the most progressive, impactful leadership discovery and how to be a leader um, that we're aware of. This is really cutting edge stuff. And what we've created for you all tonight, brand new entering UCLA graduate students in medicine, in public health, and in three flavors of management from UCLA Anderson, the executive MBA, the fully employed MBA, and the master of financial engineering. So those three Anderson programs, plus the David Geffen School of Medicine, plus the Fielding School of Public Health, you five, what you represent to me is, and this is going to sound like a cliche, but this is what's so for me. You literally are that the next pandemic does not have to go the way this pandemic has gone. And that might sound a little big right now. You haven't even started med school or public health or Anderson yet. But the way I see it, the context that I've created that I'm living into tonight with the several hundred of you who've chosen to participate, the context that I'm living in is that we're gonna need people in medicine to create the science. We're gonna need people in public health to create the policy and the framework. And we're gonna need people from management to create whatever it's gonna to take to execute such that when the world is faced with the next big challenge like this, hopefully, many years in the future, we'll have a much more powerful place to stand. So that's who you all are for me. I'm not, I'm taking off my little admission director hat tonight, my admission dean hat. You know, whether you choose to come this year or not, I don't, normally I spend a lot of time, oh, I hope they all accept their admission offer. That's not what tonight is about. Tonight is about the fact that you are making this incredible investment in your future to become a doctor, to have a master's or PhD in public health, to earn an MBA or a master of financial engineering, the five programs we have tonight. You're making that investment in yourself. You are trusting UCLA, and I wanna earn your trust tonight. UCLA has been around for 101 years. We're the youngest school in the top 20 global schools on the planet, and we're just getting started. We have a long way to go. And we want to give you something tonight, just a little taste, just a little flavor, but it's actually much more than just a taste or a flavor. We wanna give you four foundational principles to leadership tonight that you can take into this next month and the next several months before the official beginning of school, such that your fall quarter really will be the best academic quarter you've ever had in any of your prior education, that you hit UCLA at 100% and you go up from there. So I was saying those words to tell you who I am, to tell you who you are to me, and also to allow another 30 people to join our experience tonight. So that was the method to my madness. So leadership begins with leading yourself. Some of you may not even be thinking about leadership, except I suspect that you are or you would not have 
chosen to join tonight. And what we mean by that is that before anybody can listen to us, we have to earn our own trust. We have to know that we are stable and solid, that we are who we say we are, right? When you look yourself in the mirror, do you like that man or that woman, that person that looks back at you, right? And until we get right with ourselves, which is a whole lot of the discovery that graduate school allows us to have, like this is not undergrad, this is no prior education. This is my next degree. And it's the biggest degree that I've wrestled with so far. And I'm not who I was five or 10 or 15 years ago when I went to school before. So this is a unique moment in my growth and development as a human being to look that person in the eye and make something of myself. So that's kind of what we mean when we say leadership begins with leading yourself. So shall we go to the next slide? So I'd like to introduce four members of our committee before we introduce Dr. Kush Cooper. Um, so that's me on the bottom left. And the team, we have uh, several doctors and an executive director and a dean. We've got a bunch of people who really are committed that the schools of Anderson Fielding and the De David Geffen School of Medicine really, really work for you all this year's entering class. Um, I've been working with this team for a year and we've put a lot of intentionality such that last month, this month, and next month are an opportunity for you to jumpstart your education. And again, as I said, really hit the ground running when we begin the program. So I would like to first share the floor with uh, Sarika Thacker. Sarika, would you like to say some words of welcome? Hi, everyone. So nice to see everyone uh, on this Zoom session. Um, just really quickly, just wanted to say so glad that everybody's here and so glad that uh, everyone is really embracing the interdisciplinary leadership series and session that this is. Um, for me, this is really particularly personal because I actually got my master's at UCLA in the School of Public Health and then used to work at the School of Medicine and now I'm at Anderson. It's a nice coming together of all three of those for me. So thank you all for being here and thank you for sharing in this and I look forward to a great session tonight. Thank you, Sarika. And I have had the personal privilege of working with Sarika since December a year ago. So we've had about a, a year and a half and we've been through a building move and being a leader and now a global pandemic. It's like, yay, look at the fun we get to have. <laughs> and uh, Sarika brought her colleague, Liz Izquierdo, into this conversation. And I've had the pleasure of knowing Liz since last summer. Liz, would you like to say some words of welcome to your people, the, the fielding world? Yes, thank you, Dylan. Um, and thank you, everybody, for joining us this evening. And I want to again say congratulations to all of you for your acceptances to the various programs. And I just want to say to take advantage of this opportunity. This is a rare occasion where you get to meet your future colleagues interprofessionally. Never before has this been an opportunity to do before school has started. So you'll have an opportunity in some of the activities that we'll do later on to be able to form those professional relationships that we hope will carry you through your professional career. Um, so we want to thank you again for joining us and we look forward to this night's evening event and we're under great hands with Kush Cooper. Thank you, Liz. And the newest member of our team who brings a very important voice into this conversation as she's really been our partner such that we could offer this to those of you in the David Geffen School of Medicine is, is Elisa Lopez. Elisa. Thank you, Dylan. Um, this is Elisa and so great to see everyone here today. Um, welcome to the students from the David Geffen School of Medicine, but also welcome to everyone that's here. Starting graduate school at this point in time is, is unique, <laughs> more unique than probably anyone thought at this point, but, um, but we're really delighted to welcome you to the UCLA community, and we're so happy that um, we'll be able to see you on campus sooner rather than later, hopefully, um, but also um, I, I think leadership is such an important and crucial part of of the work that you're going to be doing. And so uh, it, no matter which degree program you're in, uh, you are a leader. 
for starting in that program. So welcome once again, and um, very much looking forward to today's program. Thank you, Elisa. And um, I think I introduced myself earlier. If you join late, I'm Dylan Stafford. I'm an assistant dean and director of admissions for the fully employed MBA program. And uh, if we could go to the next slide. I would like to now uh, say a couple more words. I don't mind repeating this. I don't want to talk about myself a second time, but I'm happy to talk about Kush. Again, Kush is um, our professor for tonight, and she teaches the full leadership course that tonight is a, is a small excerpt from. She teaches that to social welfare students, and I had the honor of auditing her course in winter quarter of 2016, me, the old white guy with the white shirt and the silly tie walking over to social welfare where everybody's a little more cool. I got to say people are a little more with it over on your side of campus. And uh, I had the honor of being in her graduate course and witnessing, you know, an entirely different conversation for making a difference in the world. In, in the MBA program, when we talk about internships, we talk about going to work for Disney or Google or Boeing for the summer when, Social welfare graduate students talk about internships. They, they talk about helping at pregnancy centers, helping with homelessness, helping with you know, people who need special needs and special services, an entirely different world. But what we all have in common is a commitment that this incredible graduate education we receive at UCLA, that we can bridge that out into the world. And all of you here tonight, medicine, public health, management, we are all practitioner disciplines. As, as intelligent as UCLA will make us intellectually, after we graduate, we still have to be that bridge. We still have to build that bridge between what we learned in school and going out there in front of real patients, in front of real situations in management, in front of real situations with policy and public health. So uh, Dr. Cooper is a, is a professional friend of mine and a personal friend of mine. I have the utmost respect for both her commitment, her work ethic, and the value that she brings to any conversation. She is a person I always grow around every time I hear her speak. So with no further ado, I introduce Dr. Kush Cooper, tonight's professor. Thank you, Dylan. Um, don't, you, don't you love it when uh, people re introduce you? You do so much better job than, than, than one does oneself. Um, it's like, wow, that's me. I can't sound pretty cool and important. Thank you. You Dylan. are cool and important. Um, so, you know, I, you can always look up my bio on the, uh, you know, the School of Public Affairs website. So I'm not going to really go into that. But what I do want to share with you about my background, other than I'm an adjunct professor in the School of Social Work, is, um, and I'm in the School of Public Affairs, the Department of Social Work, is that I'm all, I'm adjunct there, which means I have another job, a day job, and um, I am the CEO um, of a, a, a company that provides um, uh, support, implementation support and policy support to nonprofit organizations uh, and organizational development to, 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 to nonprofits as well. So, um, you know, I, I, wear, I wear both hats. I, I wear the professor hat. Um, but I also am a, you know, a leader every day, right? I lead my organization. I support other leaders to lead theirs. And so what I'm about to tell you um, is, is less theoretical and academic and comes, it, it, it's what's worked, right? It's, it's what, what's worked for me out there. Um, so I, I, you, the, I'll just share a little bit about the graphic you see. Uh, so the graphic you see is a word cloud that was created um, when uh, folks uh, registered for the first leadership lab. And they were asked to uh, describe the attributes of a leader that they respected. And here's how it shook out. Um, and I love that integrity is smack in the middle because we're going we're gonna to spend most of our time talking about integrity today. Uh, and uh, so let's go there. Uh, but before we do, uh, Dylan shared uh, a little bit about um, the, the summer intensive and that, that a lot of this material comes out of uh, that course. Uh, here's a, 
it's called the being a leader in the effective exercise of leadership, an ontological phenomenological model. And I want to just tell you why it's called the ontological phenomenological model. Um, it's, a, it's a fancy way of saying being in the world, right? Ontology is the study of being, right? So when people say, go be a leader, what is this, what is this being they're pointing to? Like, what, 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 what does it look like out there when somebody's being a leader? So that's the being piece. And the phenomenological piece uh, that's, um, is it is a as-lived, real-time, right-now phenomenon that is the activity of leadership that we're looking at, right? So it is, it is um, first person as lived right now. So it's the study of being as it occurs, first person as lived. So that's the ontological phenomenological model. So, well, so welcome, to, welcome to session two. Um, we, I'll, I'll go over in a moment what we went through. I'll catch everybody up uh, in case you did not attend session one. But before we do that, we would like to know where you are. We're so we, all here in Los Angeles. Where are you? So we have a poll. Uh, I didn't set this up right. So there's two questions in this poll. So only answer the first question, okay? I'm about to open up a poll and you're gonna, it's pretty darn obvious. You got six choices, but physically we would love to know where in the world you are right now. So I'm about to relaunch the polling. Only answer question number one, please. And we'll see what we get. Is it showing up everybody? I see it. Excellent. So your choices are Los Angeles, Greater Los Angeles, Southern California, but not Los Angeles, other California, outside California in the US, and outside the US. So Do, Ryan, I, I only see that. It's yeah. letting them know that they have to answer both questions in order to submit. Oh, they do? Mm-hmm. Oh, That's okay, my apology, I set this up wrong. Go ahead and just make up an answer for number two. Yeah, because you have no idea right now what it means. Yeah, I apologize. I misspoke. Okay, thank you, Liz. That's fixed it. Now it's coming in. Now it's coming in. So just make a, any answer for number two. Number one, we need a real answer. All right, so we got two-thirds of the people have voted. All right. Yeah, 10 more seconds and we'll be done here. Oh, this is looking good. All right. I think that's about it. Now, if I end polling, Ryan, then can I show it to everyone? Yes. Do, do I have to share the screen or? You, and you should be able to share results. Okay, share results. Does that make it viewable? Yes. Okay, very cool. So 43% of us are in LA, interesting. 23% are in SoCal, but not LA. So I'm gonna guess Orange County, San Diego, or Ventura up north. 11% are the rest of California. 17% are in the rest of the US. And seven out of 132 respondents are outside the US. So let's just, if you want in the chat, if you're outside the US, just throw it in there where you are. Last time we had one of our MFE students who was in Italy. So I'd love to hear where you guys are. Japan, excellent. Robin Lee, Singapore, Canada. Oh, I love it. All right. India, Hawaii, very great. All right. Well, that's just a little bit Isn't of the flavor of UCLA. All right. Anything else we should extract from that, Kush? Nope. Just, we, 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 I'm just so heartened um, just to see the, the diversity, I think, is, is, is I'm just grateful um, to be able to talk into so many different kinds of listenings. All right. So speaking of listening, 
there's a there's a particular way in which I invite you to listen. Um, and uh, uh, this will be a refresher for the folks that were in, in session one. Uh, and so there's three aspects uh, to, to the listening that I, that I invite you to bring. One is to pull the conversation to you, right? Um, rather than waiting for me to give the conversation to you, right? Um, if you cre the, the, otherwise it becomes a little bit like television and it, it even more feels like television because we're all on Zoom. So it, it's that much more important to just pull the conversation over to you in your seat. And as you do that, just try it on, right? Try it on like you would try on a jacket, right? And there will be, just like when we try on clothes and we start, you know, kind of look, look in the mirror and go, okay, there, you know, oh, well, that doesn't fit, but that does. Ooh, that looks great. I might, you know, I might move that button a little lower, right? That's, that's how I, I, I invite you to, to, to listen with regard to the information I'm about to give you. Um, the second aspect is um, I, I'd like you to do what the philosophers call bracketing, right? So even the words on the word cloud that I showed you, we come with an, you, you, you come to this session with, uh, some prior knowledge of what they might mean, right? You may have some prior notions of what leadership is and isn't. Um, so I would like you to, to take all those, those notions you might have or the, the, so the prior uh, knowledge and put brackets around it, like literally, that's, and then put brackets around all of it and just move it to the side, right? You don't have to move it too far away from you, okay? All your, you can have all of it back in an hour and a half, right? But listen newly at, to, 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 to what we're, we're gonna talk about. And that is, that's a critical, critical, critical leadership skill, is to be able to get out of the way what you already know and to be able to look at a situation newly so it can go a different way. Right? Um, because leadership is distinct from management in that um, when, the, when you've got objectives, the pathway is known, you've got a plan and you need to execute the plan, that's when really competent management is needed. But when there is no precedent, when there's no answer, when there is no agreement, we have no idea how we're gonna get where we wanna get, and we may not even know where we wanna get, that's when, that's when leadership is required. And so to be able to look at a situation newly is where innovation comes from. Innovative solutions to intractable problems, okay? And then lastly, to the degree you can, and, and, and this is probably gonna be the hardest of all three. Don't try and figure out what I'm saying. Don't try and understand what I'm saying. Don't try to put it into um, a model, right? To the degree that you can. Um, because, I mean, hey, if you leave today with some tips and some insights, I'll, I'll be happy, that's an A, right? But for the, for the A plus experience, right, you, I, I invite you to look rather than thinking. So when you're trying something on, look in your life to verify what I'm saying. Don't think about it to understand it. So that would be, the, those are the three aspects. Pull the conversation to you, bracket and this, listen newly, and don't try and figure it out. Understanding will be the consolation prize. A prize! but a consolation prize, okay? Anything else any of my colleagues would like to say? Only that the environment you described where leadership is required, where the path forward is not clear, where we actually don't know the way to go. <laughs> yeah. Does that sound like <laughs> anybody's life in 2020 on May 
19th. Yep. So well, leadership's going to be required of you, of us, all right? Good. Thank you, Dylan. All right. So let's just talk about, let's get, get caught up. Let's get the folks that weren't here caught up, and let's get the folks that were here refreshed um, with regard to what we covered in session one. So first, we uh, presented the distinction that leadership begins with leading yourself. Right, and I'll, I'll I'll give you the definition of what we mean by that in a moment. But essentially, if you can't lead yourself, right, it's going to be really hard to re to lead others. Right, when you can start to get your hands on the levers and dials of leading the critter you call you, the human being you call you, then you'll be able to get your hands on the levers and dials of what it takes to lead other humans. Yeah. Um, so, we'll, and, and we are going to talk about that a little bit later, after, right after this slide. We also talked about, we inquired into what makes extraordinary leaders extraordinary. And where we got to was that perhaps, perhaps, right, you've got to verify, again, in your own life, Right? Look, perhaps it's not what they know that makes extraordinary leaders extraordinary. Perhaps it's how they see. They see the world. The world occurs for them a particular way such that they can lead extraordinarily as their natural self-expression. They, and because they see life perhaps differently than, than you or I might in the situation where they're exhibiting extraordinary leadership, they interact with the situation differently, okay? So that's, perhaps that's what makes extraordinary leaders extraordinary. It's how they see. Uh, and we talked about, we distinguished life on the court and, versus life in the stands, okay? One is not better than the other, and, and if, we, you know, if I left you with that last, last session, um, I didn't mean to, but essentially here's the difference. Life in the stand is um, epistemological, right? It's, it's, it, it gives you an epistemological grasp of what's going on. You know about what's going on. You can explain what's going on. You can describe what's going on. Um, so if I say I'm tired, right, that's actually a description of some ontological phenomena that I'm experiencing. My eyelids are heavy. My back hurts, right? I'm tired is a concept we put on top of all of that, right? So in the stands, just like you would be at a, at a sports event, right, there's the stands. And there's people talking about the game, okay? But they actually have no impact on the game. They may think they do, right? Of course the ref's going to call it the way you want the ref to call it, right? Sure. Um, but it doesn't impact life on the court. It's distinct. So life on the court is where the game is being played. First person, as lived, in the moment, action. Right? So that is the ontological experience of life. And there's a time and place for each. Okay? When you are leading, it is most effective if you lead from the court, which is actually where the situation is unfolding, not from the stands, where the situation is not unfolding. Right? And however, right? It might be good later to evaluate how you did, right? So the epistemological grasp is important. It did then work on the court, and you can't collapse the two. So, you know, to make a tennis analogy, if I'm playing tennis, um, it's very helpful for me to know the ins and outs of the rules, see myself on film, get, you know, talk to, talk to a coach, all very important. 
But if I'm, when I'm playing tennis, if I'm going to be thinking about the rules and the score and what my coach said yesterday, Dylan, what do you think is going to happen? You think you're going to hit the ball? No, the ball's going to hit me right in the middle of the head. That's right. That's right. So that's the distinct, that's the di distinction I'm trying to make between living life on the court and life in the stands. You got to know where you are and, 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 and what approach you need. And then lastly, we um, uh, talked about the power context, right? So back to this matter of what makes extraordinary leaders extraordinary, it's how they see. Well, there's a particular, what is it that they see? What is this seeing? What it is is they have a powerful context, right, for for what it for what they're observing, for what it means to be a leader and exercise leadership effectively, and we 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 say in the course the context is decisive, right. So your way of being and your act and your actions are correlated with how a situation occurs for you, and that occurring occurs inside of a context. Right. So we talked we talked about this experiment that that Darley and Bateson did in, in, in 1973, where they talked to seminary seminarians. They said, hey, we'd like you to give a talk on the Good Samaritan parable cross campus. You know, the Good Samaritan parable about helping people. These are seminarians. They have taken an oath to help people. And then they put a struggling, they put a struggle, you know, moaning, slumped over man on the pathway between where they were and where they were going. And they, uh, they had two groups of seminarians, ones that they just said, hey, go give your talk. And one, they said, go give your talk and you better hurry because we're a little behind. Okay. And then they want to see who helped, who helped that man. And turns out only 10% of the seminarians who thought they were late helped. And 63% of those that thought they were fine on time helped. Right? So perhaps it's not the con convictions of your heart. Perhaps it's not your, what you want to be doing. Perhaps it's the context that's decisive. Right? And so what is a, what, how can you harness the power of context for leader and leadership? Right? And we ended with distinguishing two, there's two kinds of context. There is the default context, which comes from the past to shine light on a particular situation. It's, it's usually inherited. It's constituted by our experiences, our knowledge, our past, um, our upbringing, our education, right? So that's the default context that comes automatically um, with any situation, whether you're aware of it or not, every situation has a context, right? Con you contexts are required for intelligibility. You can't live life without context or it's going to be completely unconnect pieces of data flying at you, right? Context provides intelligibility. It's a shortcut, though, and shortcuts can be dangerous because you miss things, right? So there's the default context, which illuminates what it illuminates. And then there's a created context. And the created context is, doesn't come from the past. It comes standing in the future looking back, right? You create the context and you, 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 you do that using your mouth, your language, and then that context provides the intelligibility to what you're about to engage with. And so if you have, if you're operating inside a context that, well, you know, I'm not a numbers person, right? I'm not a numbers person. W math is gonna look difficult to you. You're going to have anxiety, right? If you have the created context that, wow, like this is something I've never been good at, but wow, I see an opportunity here for growth and development, then the math's going to occur differently rather than I'm not a numbers person. This is an opportunity, right? So that's default versus created context. And then we left you with a homework assignment around that. And we'll, uh, we'll, we'll I'm, I'm getting to that because I'd love to hear if people actually um, tried on what we asked them to try on. It wasn't like a, 
you have to do it. It was a be nice to do. Um, something will illuminate if you do it. Okay, so this is, we talked about this leadership is, begins with leading yourself. If you cannot lead yourself, it's unlikely you can lead others um, effectively. Um, so start with leading you, and then you'll be equipped to lead others. And how about we, the dry run for starting to lead yourself be, lead yourself to the best graduate first quarter of school you've ever had. Well, any of the first best quarter of school. Um, I love the way Dylan puts it, that you've ever had. Okay, let's lead you there and, ha pr and you practice some of these distinctions on that journey, all right? All right, so here's how we set up the, the, the homework assignment from last time. It's the quote from, from uh, Coach John Wooden, who is an icon here at UCLA, and 10 national, is it 10, 10 national yeah. championships? Ten, seven in a row, including no. seven in a row. All right, so a legend. Um, and he had this quote, which is, preparing to fare is uh, uh, failure to prepare is preparing to fail. And what all, it, you know, if I asked all these admissions officers on this call, hey, when you counsel folks about academic probation, what, what's behind the trouble they're having? They would tell you that it's rarely about their their, um, their ability to work hard or their intelligence, right? It's mostly about they didn't account for what graduate school might be like, right? They didn't account for, they didn't have a plan for when surprises hit in graduate school. They perhaps didn't condition their environment and their family, right, to support them in graduate school, right? So, we, not only would you would would you we like you'd have the best uh, uh, school quarter ever. We'd also love to see the lowest number ever of folks that m make it into those unfortunate counseling sessions, right? Because they didn't prepare. So that's the point of this. So we ask this question um, and ask folks to, to sort of take uh, what they discovered about the answer into their life. When does your UCLA graduate degree begin? Well. The answer from a default context without thinking, you're gonna say, oh, something like this. Yeah, it's, or, you know, orientation or August or, you know, whatever that first dayness is, right? Some, sometime down the road. That's, that, that, that's what he is. Now, we, we asked you to answer differently. Same question. When does your UCLA graduate degree begin? from a created context, and we had you create the following context, okay? It begins now. So for those of you that were in session one, it began in session one, okay? For those of you in session two, congratulations. Uh, at 6.13 p.m. on March 19th, your graduate degree has begun, okay? So we asked folks to notice how perhaps their way of being and acting may or may not be different when they took this created context out into their life, right? Their, degreed all, their degree's begun, right? So Dylan, I'd love to hear from some folks um, that, that, that took it on and, and like, we'd love, love to know how it went. Now, I know this is, uh, we have over 150 people on this, and uh, it's, uh, it's a little bit maybe not, um, it might not be a totally comfortable thing to want to thank you. This is my right, because there's no answer. You don't know us. There is no precedent, right? It's uncertain. That's prob that might be why you're uncomfortable. And this is the um, this is the future that I need you all to prepare for. This is my eight year old. So um, when I say that you guys are going to create the world we get to live in, this is the world you're going to take care of, in my opinion. So I would love to invite Christian. No, we're not going to be silly. Um, I would love to invite uh, anyone who was in last month's first leadership lab and who who actually engaged with this like a discovery, not like the right or wrong way to do it, but did you take it on like an opportunity, like a bonus assignment? 
wow, if my graduate degree began last month, April, whatever the day was, April 28th or 18th, what did you see? So if you'd like to, we'll just um, use the good old blue hand feature. I think everybody knows that feature now in Zoom, if you raise your hand. And we would love to hear, I know this is a little bit of a bold ask, but you guys are admitted to UCLA, some of the most intelligent people on the planet, and you're also bold. So who would like to share who, what they saw in living in a created context between Leadership Lab number one and where we are tonight? All right, Larissa, please. Yay! And maybe, maybe Larissa, if you don't mind, just tell us, tell us who you are and which program you're in, just so we have a sense of you. And thank you for being bold enough to go first. <laughs> sure. Oh, well, I really loved, I loved that suggestion um, or invitation. Um, I'm Larissa, and I'm going to be doing the Executive MBA program. Um, let's see. I. Well, there is a faculty member that I'm particularly excited to work with, and I was just planning to take her classes when school started, um, but I ended up ordering her book that I knew she had written from her bio, and we'll just start, start learning from her now and be ready with questions and interest when the program starts. It's perfect, Larissa, perfect. All right, brilliant. This brilliant illustration of how your way of being and acting, right, the actions you took were different inside of the created context. All right, beautiful, brilliant. Thank you. Who else do we have? Dylan? I see Matthew Kirschenmann. Matthew, would you like to say what you saw? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, hi, Matthew Kirschenman. Um, I'm Matthew. here in West LA, so not too far. Uh, thank you, Kush. I appreciate that. Nice to meet you. Great uh, first session. I actually rewatched it recently just to kind of hammer home some of those points that, that you had made. I thought those were really good. Um, thank you. And so in, in thinking through those, uh, you know, how I tried personally to think through the creating a context or thinking through things uh, with a different context. Um, you know, I started thinking about instead of how, uh, how the journey would be to get somewhere and how, it, sorry, I'm uh, in the executive MBA program, um, how uh, would something look like to get to where I wanna be instead how will I have to change my thinking once I'm in that position? Mm. Um, and so personally, I've went on LinkedIn learning a lot and uh, done a fair amount of their executive uh, intelligence, emotional intelligence videos, and then started to implement some, some of the uh, different things I've learned from that. And it's actually been pretty informative, especially now, as every meeting you're having uh, is a virtual meeting, you are now forced to actually slow down a lot more. Oh yeah. Um, whether you're reacting to something or describing something and uh, just uh, some tools I've read and, and seen are, are pretty good. So thank you. You're welcome, you're welcome. And so this, what I'm hearing is that you, 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 started, you started learning you, you started going on LinkedIn, learning a particular way because rather than be, now, rather than waiting to get somewhere. And, and, exactly. and, and you know, that, that you, what, what you're pointing to is someday, right? Have you noticed, folks, that someday never comes? Because it's always someday, right? And so when you find yourself in someday, right? You're 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 in you're in a default context. I pretty much guarantee um, you're 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 in a default context. So you uh, you chose not to do something someday, which never comes. You chose to do it now, which is really, folks, all there is. The past doesn't exist. The future doesn't exist. They are all figments of our imagination. Right. All there is is right now 
and right now, and another right now, right? And that's where action happens. It doesn't happen in the past or in the future. It's great, Matthew. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Um, Pavel, let me pronounce your last name, Ozaletsky. Yeah, uh, right. Thank you, Dylan. Um, I actually uh, start the exploration of what is available for me, where I, where I can get some experience from UCLA. And uh, I enrolled in a couple of events from Eastern Technology Center. I learned about um, interesting contest of innovation where a multidisciplinary team create um, pretty fascinating uh, and like ideas and implement these uh, products. So um, it was exciting. And um, yeah, that's what I did. Really good. And, and do you think you might have done that at this point in the year? If you, if, if, if you might have, you might be that kind of person. You, you, yeah, I, I might start exploring, but uh, the, the trigger that, oh, uh, there You're is like, something that is available for me right now. So why don't I try to figure out what is available and what kind of I can uh, explore? Did you pay these people, Dylan? <laughs> oh, big bucks. Yes. They got a free sandwich. Beautiful. Oh, Beautiful. Beautiful. Uh, th th they're Embas. <laughs> we, we, I did we, notice that. <laughs> I you, noticed Emma. that. Right? I didn't want to. I don't want to say it, but um, you guys are. You guys are. Um, uh, they're going to give you a run for your money. <laughs> I think so. Nice good. Leadership. Good stuff. Very good. Very good. Um, I, Dylan, should we take a couple more? Should we move yeah, on? We, What's your we, sense? We have, we have two more people. Let's. We'll. Um, yeah. Great. We'll with the next two in line, which was uh, Nicole Rodriguez, and then after that, we'll we'll hear from Kevin Chung, and then we'll then we'll go forward. There are a few good ones in the chat too. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see those. I was only looking at the blue hands. So, Nicole, why don't we, if we could hear from you, what did you see for yourself? Awesome. Yeah. So, also um, an EMBA student, excited um, to be part of this class, and so for me um also knowing that i uh, i also run a company and i have to condition my team uh to get it's it's almost like preparing that mom isn't always going to be sort of there to be hands-on so i've actually um i signed up because i have my own personal anxiety with math i'm taking <laughs> the uh, ucla extension um math course just to kind of condition myself to get back into it because I've been out of school for a while and in the professional world. So signed up for that class and then I decided, okay, wait a minute. I've got to condition the team so that they know that there are certain times that from here on out till I get my degree, I'm going to be studying. So they're going to have to know that it's not a 24 hour because I'm usually available 24 hours a day, seven days a week for the team and clients. So I'm like, okay, I'm getting everyone ready for me not being available to them so that I can be available for myself. And so I've set like study hours for seven days, um, even on weekends. So uh, I'm getting an A in the math class. That never happens. Um, so <laughs> I'm like, I'm really, I was like, oh my God, this is working. Like, so really, really just showing up for myself with my schedule, which I'm, you know, a lot of us don't, don't always do, especially as leaders, we, we give and we give and we give. Um, so it feels good to, to know that I've set time for myself and that it's working so that when I get into the, you know, the next phases, I'm already conditioned and so, so are the members of my team and uh, right. my clients. Yeah, and isn't it, isn't it nice to do it now and <laughs> fail a few times while you're still there? Oh yeah, definitely. Rather than Oh, let's try it now when I'm gone. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Great. Brilliant. Brilliant. Thank you, Nicole, very much. That's what we're talking about, right? That's what we're talking about. Beautiful. And um, I, Kush, if I could, I'll do actually two people. I'd like to hear from Kevin. And then I would love to hear from, I see in the chat, because I don't think we've heard a, a person from medicine, Bronwyn Stone. So I'd love to hear Bronwyn wrote a little example from what they saw. But let's hear, uh, Kevin Chung, could you tell us what you saw? Yes, thank you for the intro. And I'll hopefully provide more of a FEMBA perspective as <laughs> I'm a part of that group in the 2023 class um, up in the Bay Area in Palo Alto. So looking forward to connecting with all of you soon. Um, I think that this is almost more of a 
individual realization, but also uh, a shout out to some of the folks that have really early on begun the networking process. And I think the realization that a lot of the networking can start today um, got many of us to step up and begin networking with each other, getting to really know the group. Um, you know, in a way, I guess COVID has also forced us to realize that we can't just wait until that first in-person session to begin networking. Um, so I think that's really motivated a lot of us to connect with each other. Um, and, and also realizing that in many ways, and I've heard that, you know, as our cohorts split, that it actually may be more difficult to, you know, meet folks from a really broad spectrum um, than now where we have everyone just kind of waiting for, you know, that first day of class where they're going to get in. So I think it's just a, a great time to, to reach out. And I really want to give a shout out to the other folks that have begun that process as well. So great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank Kevin. You. Yeah, thank you for representing Palo Alto. I lived on Ramona Street for two years, my <laughs> first two years out of grad that's very, school. Yeah, it's a middle school near <laughs> on that street, so that's great to hear. That's awesome. You, you know, you, know uh, you, you all uh, of you, at least the ones in session one, uh, to, to, people don't go around creating context, right? It's, it's kind of weird. Right? So you are now officially part of a weird crew that can actually create, right, the future you're living into, right? Um, and I just, I wanted to emphasize that it, for especially like, and it's coming just out in just it's oozing out of the folks that have shared, like, it takes a big person to give up a default context. Because those are super comfortable and predictable. So I just wanted to underline that. Uh, that I, just, it, it does take something. Uh, so I want to congratulate you on having taken it on. Who, who do you have next, Dylan? So I think we'll, our, our final person, because I would love to hear a voice from medicine. So Bronwyn Stone wrote, Bronwyn, would you uh, be willing to kind of share that out loud with us, what, what you saw since last session? Yeah, definitely. So um, I was thinking about, okay, starting grad school. That's something I've never done before, but I have friends that are in a graduate program or have finished. So I just reached out to them and said, what did you do to prepare? What did you wish you had done to prepare? And uh, their answers were really thought provoking and helpful. And I think the best part of it was those friends that I spoke with said, you know, they're there if I ever need anything or need advice as I go through it. So now I feel like also my support team gets a little bit broader. Wow. So thank you for the suggestion. Wow. That's, that's, let's underline that one. Your entire support, your, your immediate circle of folks, they're all going to grad school with you. Right? Grad school becomes a family affair. Um, and so to the degree that you can get their support and maybe ask them what they need, right? You're going to be gone, right, for, for more than you usually are. It, it'll, to the degree, degree you can do that, it'll go that much more smoothly because uh, uh, it's really much easier to transcend problems in groups than to suffer in silence. So thank you, thank you, thank you, Brahman. Beautiful. All right. I would just add this little last one, Kush, on behalf of everyone. You all, I would guess, have a context for education, which is I'm pretty darn good when it comes to going to school. And that's awesome. And that's what had you earn your seat at UCLA in any of the programs here tonight. I invite you to try on another context, which is, hey, but I'm also free to not know. Because sometimes we have this problem in Anderson, people walk in the door, they've had so much success that they don't have any room to learn something new. And if I could share my biggest regret from grad school, I was so limited by my context that I'm supposed to make good grades that I cheated myself. I did not take the class with Eugene Fama because I was afraid he would be too hard and I would get a C. Guess what happened a few years after I graduated? Eugene Fama won the Nobel Prize. 
but I cheated myself because my context was I can only make a B or better. Had I surrendered that context and said, hey, I'm in grad school. The point of this is to learn all this stuff I don't know. I would have had the freedom to have a class with a Nobel laureate, a future Nobel laureate, as an example. But all of these, buying the book from the professor, reaching out early, it's so proactive. I'm just loving this. Thank you, Kush. Yeah, no, thank you. Those were all things on the list we wanted to share with them, and they just got illustrated. I love that. All right. So let's, we are, let's move on to what, what some of the new distinctions for today. All right. All right. Let's see. Okay, so um, today we're going to cover um, being a person of integrity and being authentic, right? And we'll get into, so those are two of what, what we call the four fundamentals uh, in, in terms of leader, being a leader and exercising leadership effectively. And we'll go through the, the next two in session three. All right. All right, here we go. So when I say the four, I do a lot of sports analogies. Um, so when I say four fundamentals, I kind of mean like basketball, right? Like, yeah, you got to, you, there's the fancy stuff, right? But if you can't do a layup, pass the ball, dribble, and take a jump shot, right? The fancy stuff doesn't matter, right? You, you, have to, you have to be able to do those four things. And so I, I'd like you to listen to the, the, the four fundamentals like that, right? There may be fancier stuff with regard to leadership. I mean, there's articles about it and seven competencies of this leader. And you know, there, you can do the fancy stuff, but it's got to be on top of the fundamentals. Right? And if you just have the fundamentals, that's enough. I've, I've observed, that's enough. All right. So here are the four foundational factors of the fundamentals. Being a person of integrity, being authentic, being given, being an action by something bigger than oneself, and being cause in the matter. And we say when mastered, these four factors form the foundation for being a leader in the effective exercise of leadership. So before we go into that, I want to say a word on mastery. What do I mean by when mastered? What does it mean to master something? Okay, This integrity, this authenticity, created context, leader and leadership itself. What does mastery mean in those areas? Well, what I mean by mastery is that it becomes part of who you are, right? In contrast to becoming something you know and understand and think about. It becomes part of you are. So to speak, it becomes your natural self-expression. Spontaneously, in the moment, you can do it, right? So, you know, Knowing and understanding isn't bad, again. Like, there's a time and a place for both, right? Because when you know and understand something, you do expand your function in the world. You do. It does add to your function in the world. But remember, perhaps it's not what you know as a leader. It's what you see, right? So when you've mastered something because... Because of that mastery, the world occurs differently, right? So essentially, you have altered the world inside which you function, right? You are, when, when you've mastered something, you are living in a new world, the new world of that thing. So that's what I mean by mastery. It's part of who you are. It's your natural self-expression. Um, and it, you, you, you're, you're in a new world because you've mastered the conversational domain that it is. Um, so let's, let's do, let's do an illustration. Um, who, anybody, anybody, um, been a dancer that, that would like to help me illustrate? Anybody in the crowd? Professional cheerleader. <laughs> oh, there we go. Okay, great. That's dancing. 
That's dancing. Same, same All same. right, Nicole. So um, tell me about when, when you first started cheerleading, right? There you are. You got the, the you, you show up for, I, I've never, I've never cheer led, I think. So what, there you are. Okay, you're going to do it. Day one. Yeah. Tell us what that's like. Uh, back when, like, elementary school or doing it p professionally? Professionally. Pro okay. Um, well, first of all, there are nerves because you know that uh, the, literally the world is watching in, in certain ways. Um, so there's a lot of practice that comes with it. And not just the practice that's assigned to you, but the practice that you do outside of the practice that's assigned to you to make sure that when you hit the field for the first time, you aren't the one that everyone's staring good. at, not for good reasons. <laughs> good, very good. And so, and there's a, there are particular cheers you learn, right? There's particular cheers, dances, sequences, right? Everything. Yeah. So, so day one, dance one, mm. right? Day one, dance one. There you are. Yep. What's what's it like? What's it like doing that dance? Um, I mean, it's an adrenaline rush for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. because then at that point you are you know that the the audience is looking at you um not just to be entertained but they they want you to succeed right so you you feel that hype and that energy from the audience so just feeling that and knowing that again your job is to perform and not mess up it's it's basically everything that you had practiced you just you execute with a ton of energy and and love um yeah. at least that's what i remember and um yeah so when you practiced that dance that you executed, mm -hmm. right, before you knew the dance that you executed, how did, the, how, did, how did it occur for you? How did the choreography occur for you? Um, I mean, obviously I had a director and we had, um, you know, she, she led us through it the first time and I remember watching her do it each and every time she'd be like, okay, this is the dance you're about to learn. And then you just do this like, okay, I have to do that. Like, she makes it look so flawless and, I mean, incredible. Uh -huh. There's a little bit of fear that's like, that So you're thinking, thinking, moves. thinking. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I, I, right? And you're, you're learning the moves, you know, like, you're learning the moves, you're not... Right? Overthinking, so, yeah. Miss, yeah. Missing the steps, all of that. That's right. But as you practice, you expand your function, right, yes. inside, of that, inside of that dance. Now, um... Let's go forward to what you described about there you are on the field, right? Mm -hmm. You've practiced, right? How does it occur, occur now? Oh, are you? There's pride, there's, um, there's joy, there's, there's excitement. Um, knowing that, you know, the time that was put in before getting to that point, um, every hour, every minute spent in preparation um, led to a really positive outcome and an enjoyable very first time on the field. And were you thinking about no. the moves? No, it, they just, you hear the music and your body just goes. That's, so that's what I mean, right? That, they couldn't say it any better. You hear them and your body just goes. That's what we mean by natural self-expression. And it takes practice, folks. That, that's the other thing Nicole's illustrating so beautifully is natural self-expression doesn't come they don't descend on you, right? It takes practice. It takes practice. So that's, so you could say when, when she first started practicing, Nicole was using the dance. Yeah. But when they, there, there she was in the field, she, the, she was used by the dance. The dance was just, just flowing through her, right? And so I that's, have <laughs> Thanks for the memory, the, the memory jog. <laughs> there it is, right? That, that, that's what I mean by mastery. I'm not talking about knowing a lot. I'm talking about what Nicole just illustrated. Okay, beautiful. Thank you, Nicole. My pleasure. Okay, so what is required to master, mastering something? What is actually the mechanism? What is that shift? Well, it requires you discovering it for yourself, right? How am I going to do what she's doing isn't gonna isn't gonna give you the dance, right? What's gonna give you the dance is you're on the court, on the dance floor, doing the dance and discovering it for yourself, right? Where to sit, where to, you know, where, where to move, right? So 
that's what mastery requires. So, and, and how do you discover something for yourself? Well, you got to be engaged with it exactly as it is on the court as itself. Not your picture of it, not your wish for it, not your story about it, not what you read in the book about it, it itself coming at you real time, right? That's when you engage and you discover for yourself. And I would assert that the only way to access being a leader and exercising leadership effectively is to discover for yourself those phenomena as they are called for in your engagement with life, right? That's not gonna happen on this webinar. Too bad, right? So sorry. This is not the court. Just because you understand mastery here, right, doesn't mean you can discover for yourself. You have to go get on the court after this session, right, and discover for yourself. Engage with life. And sometimes the shot's going to go in. Sometimes it's not, right? You get practice. Right, so that's what discovering for yourself, right? So if I give you tips, you know how you've read a book about, you know, like the, if you've read a book about something, right, in, in the past, you can't do it because you read the book, right? You, you, you do it when you practice. So that's what I mean. Out there on the court. All right. So now when I now hear integrity, like, okay, I'm going to let me look for myself, how this might look for me in my life, and then let me go out and practice it. Right? Not as like, oh, that's an interesting definition of integrity, Cooch. Not like that. Like, oh, let me look for myself. Ooh, wow, I'd have to do that. Like that. Okay? So being a person of integrity. All right. So uh, remember the bracketing? Okay, you have a notion, you brought a default context for integrity in, in, into this session, okay? I need you to put brackets around it. Just move it aside. You don't have to move it far. You can have it back, but I'd like you to listen to integrity newly, all right? So maybe integrity for a person is simply a matter of their word. Your integrity is a matter of your word, nothing more. Nothing less. Maybe. Okay, so start to look. Huh. Let me think about somebody that had integrity that, that, that I experienced. So what about your word? Well, this is the dictionary one of the dictionary definitions of integrity. It's more like engineers hold it or physicists hold it rather than how um, uh, perhaps those of us in, 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 in the moral world hold it, right? It's the degree to which that word is whole, complete, unbroken, unimpaired, sound, and in perfect condition, right? So to the degree that your word is whole, complete, unbroken, unimpaired, sound, and in perfect condition, that's the degree to which you have integrity, okay? All right. So, what what is what, what do I mean by word, right? Okay. Um, all right. Well, there's you thought that there's just one kind of word, right? There's six. This is just the first one, and they, but this is the one that commonly say, well, okay, well, what's your word? Well, I said I would. It's what I said I would do. I promised that out loud. It's what I said I would. That's my word. I gave my word. Okay. So it's whatever you said you would do or won't do. Um, and in the case of if you are going to do it, you're going to do it on time, right? That's what that's uh, what you said you would do, right? All right, there's five more. Okay, what you know to do, whatever you know to do or know not to do, and if it is due, doing it as you know it is meant to be done and doing it on time. Unless you have explicitly said to the contrary. Right. Um, so, um, look, 
you know that if there's um, like what what is something one knows to do? Um, somebody somebody is an elderly person is crossing the street, right? And and that the red the red numbers are counting down, right? And they're in the middle of the crosswalk, and that's that number is going to hit zero, right? They're going to need to get across faster than they're getting up. So you 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 know what to do. You you know that 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 there there's a calling to help, right? And so not helping. I mean, particularly if you're a seminarian or a social worker, right? That's not doing what you know to do. That's a matter of your word. Turns out. Turns out. Okay. Number three. What is expected of you, i.e., unexpressed requests of you? Okay, now, this is the one people often have the most time with. What do you mean? That's a matter of my word. I'm, I even, I mean, I mean, they didn't even say they ex they expected that of me. Okay, and it's only important that you make this an aspect of your word with with people you wish to have a workable relationship. Right? If you don't want to have a workable relationship with someone, don't don't worry about it. Don't do what you're expected to do, right? But if you go, if you come to my house at 10 a.m. on Saturday, Saturday number one, Saturday number two, Saturday number three, and we have coffee, I'm now expecting you to come on Saturday number four. It doesn't matter whether you said it or not, right? That's a matter of your word unless you say, hey, you know, I've been coming for the last three Saturdays and, and I'm not going to make it. I'm not gonna make it this time. Okay, so there you go. Word three. Okay, word four. What you say is so. Whenever you've given your word to others as to the existence of something or some state of the world, right, your word includes being willing to be held accountable that the others would find evidence um, with what you have asserted, like with regard to what you have asserted and find that valid for themselves. Okay. So this is things you have given your word, like you said that um, the existence of something, something is, this is that way, right? Or 47% of this population lives in poverty, right? That is now a matter of your word, right? You said that's what's so, all right? That's an aspect of your word. I, you know, this is this is the point at which I start getting uncomfortable, right? Because the, the, all the out integrities, right, start to flash before me. What you say you stand for, that is what you say that your life is about, and for what you can unquestionably be counted on. Okay, whether expressed in the form of a declaration that you've made to one or more people or even to yourself, you know, those secret declarations, as well as what you allow people to believe that you stand for. It's all part of your word, okay? So if you stand for integrity and, you know, show up on time, you are now out of integrity, right? Because you, you declared, well, yeah, integrity is important to me. And then lastly, the moral, ethical, and legal standards of the groups in which you wish to enjoy membership. So um, here, let me illustrate. Um, which, which, of my here, which of my colleagues here has a driver's license? Which, which, of, you, which of you? Let's hear from somebody, not Dylan. I do. Oh, very good. Okay. At least says you haven't used it a lot recently, but you have. That's right. <laughs> yeah. So, um, do you speed? Um, upon occasion. Right. I, I, I speed. Right. Okay. Just, just, just so, no, no judgment. So, do you know that when you sign for that driver's license, Elisa? You actually promised not to speed. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. So 
That's a legal standard. So if you wish to enjoy membership of driver, be, be a member of the group that's drivers, now speeding has become a matter of your word. And now if, there might be a little voice screaming going, wait a minute, wait a minute. Like, really? Like speeding and I'm out of integrity? Hang on. Uh, as one of our mentors says, keep your soul in the room. Like, keep your foot in the room. All right. Okay, so those are six aspects of your word. So here's what I want you to, we're going to do a poll. So I want, I want you to take a pic, if you can, take a picture of the screen or a screenshot so you have these six aspects of word. All right, let me give you a few seconds to do that. And I'm also like before, you'll have to answer, I'm gonna relaunch the poll. So you have to answer the geography question number one again, newly, such that you can complete the poll. And then you will address the second question, which will be which of these six elements of word defined, what was it Kush, which one? Which one do you, which aspect do you, you know, if you look in your life, which one do you struggle with the most? Yeah. Right, like to, to really like, keep your word that that kind of word yeah all right so i'd like so uh, you know the one it's here's the one i struggle with the most um it is uh what's expected of me right like i get a little irritated actually even a little righteous when somebody expects something of me and didn't say it right and it's just it it it, it takes eating a little crow for me to deal with like, no, no, that's your word. Yeah. And you teach leadership. It's that's what like, I stand for. It's, so. like, it's like mom's birthday, right? Yeah. yeah. How, how dare mom get mad that I forgot her birthday? Woo, try that out. Mm-hmm. Yep. So which aspect of word do you struggle with the most? All right. Shall we launch the poll? We shall. All right. Relaunching poll will clear existing polling results. Do I want to continue? Yes. All right. We are relaunching. So you have to answer number one again before you can get to number two, please. Yeah. Six elements of word. Forty percent have voted. Fifty percent have voted. Sixty percent have voted. Seventy percent have voted. Seventy-five, seventy-eight, seventy-nine, eighty, eighty-one percent, eighty-four, eighty-five, eighty-six, eighty-seven, eighty-nine. All right, three more seconds. Ninety percent. Ninety-two percent. Oh, you guys are awesome. 93%, three, two, one, end polling. All right, Results. what's it say? Let me look. Ah, yes. It's, 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 the, 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 what is expected, the unexpressed requests of you. That is, that is the, often the one most people find, find, find the hardest. And look, you're not, and we'll get into this a little more later, you don't get a medal. Like you're not a good person because um, you either did or you're not a bad person because you didn't um, hold what's expected of you as your word. It's just that every out integrity, like in, every out integrity sucks a little bit of power, right? So, okay, I speed. So, ima so imagine it's like losing a finger, okay? Right? I speed. Oh, eh. I I, I didn't I didn't get my mother a card on Mother's Day. I did. But, um, right? Okay, one finger. I still write. I can still do everything. Right? Okay. Now it's a little tougher. I could probably still function. Right? But as you start. When they start to add up, 
I can't do anything with this hand now, right? I lack power, right? And not power like domination, but the degree to which you can produce results with velocity, kind of like the physicist told power, right? So you are giving away juice and we're human, it's gonna happen, right? But where you can restore it, if you can restore it, you get some power back. In this case, you can get a finger back. Very good. Um, and you know, here's the kicker with the, with the, the, the it's even worse, that, that number three, right? And get, it doesn't work in reverse. It's asymmetrical. Other people, your expectations of other people are not a matter of their word. How about that? All right, it's not, it's not a matter. If, as a leader, somebody who cares about their word, you've got to be explicit. If that's an expectation, check it out. Because otherwise, you'll be out of integrity. And it's not for them, it's for you, it's your power that we're worried about today. So, all right, so th there's, a, there's a way out of this. For those of you that are like, oh great, I'm gonna be crippled. Like I'm not gonna be able to walk or write ever again, okay? So it's not about keeping your word, right? It's about honoring your word, right? As long as you honor your word, you are a person of integrity. Okay, so let's talk about that. All right. Well, I just said that. Um, the result of honoring your word, not keeping it. Well, sometimes it's wholly inappropriate to keep your word. Like, oh, I said I'd go to a birthday party um, of my best friend at four o'clock on Sunday. My mom got in a car accident. It'd be wholly inappropriate for you to go to the birthday party, right? I mean, so that's an instance. Sometimes you just don't feel like it, right? The reason actually doesn't matter. It doesn't matter why you're not keeping your word, right? It's all the same. It's all a reason. It, it's about you want to just make sure that you honor that you gave your word. It's counterintuitive. How can I be a person of integrity when I don't keep my word? Try it. Just try it out. You got you to practice on the court. Okay, it's a little counterintuitive. And here's our, th this is my, what I call the New Year's resolution bullet, the last one, right? Honor on one's word to oneself is often the most challenging. You sell yourself out first. You know, those, those New Year's resolutions you made? Oh yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to the gym. 6 a.m. every day, I'm gonna do it. Right? Tough. The, the extraordinary leaders, they honor their word to themselves. So how do you do that? How does one honor one's word? We've got a particular technology. So you can use this or anything else that works. All right, well, the easiest way to do it is to keep your word and keep it on time. That, that's the easiest way, when, when, when you can, okay? Or whenever you will not be keeping your word, just as soon as you become aware the second you become aware right, that you will not be keeping your word, including not keeping your word on time, saying the following to everyone impacted. And I'll get to that in a moment, but I want to emphasize, look, you know when you're late, you're already late, like before you're late. And you know that, right? Like, you know, you're not going to make it on time. You know, whatever the, the, the you know, you spilled coffee on your shirt, you, whatever happened right? What, what out of integrity behavior looks like is sort of hoping no one will notice or taking the gamble that you kind of might get there on time, right? What you do, the second you spill that coffee on your, you, you know you might be late, you call. Say, hey, I'm, I'm not going to be, be there on time. I know I said I would. Doesn't matter the reason. In fact, you don't have to give the reason, frankly. Have, giving the reason actually robs you of power. Because the reason then is in charge, not you. Okay, so this is what you do. Okay, 
you can say, okay, so I'm not going to, I'm not going to be keeping my word. Okay. So I'm not going to make it there at eight o'clock. Like I said, I would. Okay. And I'll say, I'll either be there, either I'll say something like, you know, I'll, I'll make it by 815. Right. So I'm not going to be there at eight. Like I said, I would. I'll be there by 815 or, hey, I'm not going to make it. Right. It could be that your car didn't start. I'm not going to make it. So either you're going to be keeping that word in the future or you're not going to be keeping it at all. This is the one people don't do. This is the one people forget the most. And offer that you will do what there is to do to deal with the impact on others of the failure to keep your word. So I know I said there I'd be at 8 o'clock. I said I'll be there at 8 o'clock. I'm not going to be there till 8.30. I know that the agenda had me going first, right? And that this is going to completely screw up the, what you had planned. What can I do? Right? Like, what can I do to mitigate that? And sometimes they'll say nothing. It's okay. I get it. And sometimes they might say, well, you know what? Just call in. Can you call in on your way? So in case we have a question, um, you're at least there to answer it. Right? There. Now, now, it doesn't matter if you're there at eight. Now, you are a person of integrity if you've done that. Hmm? So, okay, fine. I get integrity, and I, I alluded to this a little earlier. So what's the big deal? Okay, matter of my word. Turns out, for high performance or to make a big difference, integrity is required, right? So again, let's hold it like the physicist told it. What your car, does, you know, the motor mount on your car is broken. I've had a broken motor mount uh, recently. Uh, they are expensive to fix. So your motor mount doesn't work. Okay, doesn't have integrity, broken, the, me the metal wasn't made right, or whatever that is, no integrity, okay? Your car's just not gonna perform. And, and that's, the, 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 that's how some, you need, your, the parts have to have integrity for it to perform as designed. So your word has to have integrity for you to perform, right? Because it sources workability. Just like the car part working makes the car work, you honoring your word makes makes leadership work. It makes so much more work. Actually, it makes your life work. Uh, but we're talking about leadership right now. Okay, fine. You might even be with me there. I get it. Car won't work. You know, part doesn't work. Car won't work. Okay, but then how come every time I turn on the TV or look at a newspaper, Koosh, all I see is out of integrity behavior? How come all this, this word hasn't gotten around that it's fundamental to performance? Right? This is why. Because we collapse it with morality. Right? Consider, it's the bracket moment again, bracket integrity, like it's a good thing to have it and a bad thing not to have it. It's neither good nor bad to have it. Right? You have it or you don't. It's like gravity. Like gravity isn't good or bad. It just is. But it must be accounted for. Right? must be accounted for because you don't account for gravity, uh, you are not going to perform whatever you intended to perform, you're likely to go splat, right? Try not accounting for gravity and, and, and you know, cheerleading, right? Like Nicole, like, yeah. But you're not mad at gravity, it, it, it is, okay? Because we think it's a moral matter, right? Now, we start to hide, right? Because we won't be a bad person. I don't want to be a bad person. I was late. I'm a bad person. This professor's never, you know, like, you know, going to hate me for the rest of the class and I'm late, right? So then we start hiding. And that hiding completely obfuscates our capacity to restore integrity, right? Because all there is to do is like, hey, no, you know, not, I, I you know, I know I've given my word to, be on time to class, by the way, you have. If you accepted, if you accepted admit, admission to UCLA, you've given your word to be on class on time, just saying. So um, you, you, all there is to do is like, you know, I'm so, I'm so sorry, I, I didn't keep, I wasn't here at eight, I disrupted your class, just wanna acknowledge I'm here. Um, and you know, if there's anything like I could, you know, I promise I'm gonna be there on time tomorrow and just let me know 
if if I, if there's anything I can do to make it up to you. Mm-hmm. And they'll say what they'll say. All right, I, I'm gonna skip this piece to just keep us going. All right, so just like people, organizations have integrity. So to the degree the organization's word is whole, complete, unbroken, unimpaired, and in sound working condition, it has integrity. That I get ahead of my slides sometimes. Right? So that is to say an organization honors its word internally to the members of its organization and between the members of its organization and externally with, the, with those that the organization, those entities the organization deals with. Right? So, you know, for those of you in public health that, that might be working in nonprofits, the mission, an organization's mission, that's a matter of their word. Right? So to the degree you're not um, staying close to your mission and you haven't said you're changing it, now the organization's out of integrity. Um, and this includes what it said on behalf of the organization to its members as well as outsiders, okay? Um, so the organizations, there's a, a colleague of ours that, te- that uses this technology to, you know, like consult for um, like, PG&E and Reebok and, you know, the big ones, like, you know, Fortune 100 companies. And when they, you know, you often what they'll say is, you know, we need to take it to the next level and we're stuck. Can you help us take it to the next level? And what our colleague goes after first is the integrity of the organization because it's impacting power. You go at the promises that were broken and watch, just watch what happens to productivity. So Can try it. Can I add, there's a comment Absolutely. In the chat room. What is the best way to establish word that is expected of you by others in a professional setting without the growing pains of trial and error? So, could you just read that one more time and then track yeah. it? Uh-huh. What is the best way to establish word mm-hmm. that is expected of you by others in a professional setting without the growing pains of the trial and error? Ah, yes. So uh, to, to actually like, to figure out, you know, to actually understand what's expected of you. I mean, it is, I know this is going to sound simplistic, right? But you got to ask, right? You, you, I would like to know what your expectations of me are, right? I've read the job description, but I'm just wondering if there's anything else, right? Or if you sense something's off, right? Your brain can tell when, when, when something's off in someone else's brain. Um, clarifying, like, hey, I get the sense, I get the sense that you were counting on me for that. And I, I'm so sorry, like I should, you know, like I, I should have let you know I'm not accountable for that today or this month or whatever, right? So you, you to open your mouth. Right? No. So, okay. So now we're at our group exercise. All right. So, grad school and integrity. All right. We're going we're gonna to send you off in the groups. Right? Again, you don't get a medal or 50 lashes if you're in integrity or out of integrity. You just are or you aren't. Regarding your preparation, identify one important issue or area that's out of integrity, you know, where you're not honoring your word. And like, what might restoring integrity in that area, right, what what, what would that look like? Like, what would your preparation look like to be sort of fully in integrity in that area? All right. Okay, Dylan, I'll turn it over to you. All right. And um, Ryan, we're going to send people into groups of um, five, I think. Welcome back, welcome back, welcome back. We have a couple more rooms. All right, we're getting close to the number we were, where we were when we left, Kush. So I think you can. Okay. Go ahead and get. All right. So so we're 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 on the home stretch, folks, for for this uh, for this session. Um, we, uh, well, so we gave you 
two words, right? We said we we're going to cover integrity and authenticity, and we also said that you're going to get out of here at 730. So we are not going to keep the word to go through authenticity because I can cover that next time, and we are going to go ahead and, and keep our word to get you out at 730. Uh, the, and we'll do some announcements uh, before uh, we set you up for uh, what we'd like you to practice on the court. So, all right. So, what an, um, what announcements do we have for them? Um, just a couple, real quick. Uh, we hope you're enjoying this conversation. We're going to give you homework between now and June 16th. June 16th will be our third and final of the three leadership labs. So that's the first one. Please uh, save that date, 5:30 to 7:30 California time on Tuesday, June 16th, will be leadership lab number three. Um, Sarika Thacker, the executive director of the Executive MBA program, will send you a survey and we would love your um, yes, no's and maybes, all your uh, experience of, of being here today. We would love if you could take the couple minutes to fill out the survey that will help us improve. And we will also include a recording of today. So that link will be included also. So please, if you would watch for that survey in the next two days, uh, we, with Sarika, we will get the recording set up and then we will send you a post-event survey. We would love your feedback. Back to you, Kush. All right. Let me go back to our... So here's what, there's like, this is like the bonus round. Hold on, let me find my slide. Where is it? Bear with me. There. Okay. So, um, it's a bonus round. You don't have to, uh, but I, I suspect it will make a big difference. Uh, that area that you distinguished, um, the area where you're out of integrity, um, go, go, how, how about you go restore integrity to that area, right, between, between now and, um, and the next session? And uh, it doesn't have to be that area. It could be, I'm, I'm sure if you look, there's plenty to choose from. We all have plenty of out integrities to choose from. Um, so what's it gonna look like, right? We'll, we'll demonstrate for you what that looks like, right? What does it look like to go ahead and honor your word and restore integrity and airing where it's out? Um, first, let, let me see if um, there's a hand up right away from a participant who knows they're gonna go clean it up. You just, you're gonna go do it, you know that. Raise your hand and, and if, if, you, if, you'd, if you'd like to, like we'll do your assignment now. Um, Nicole, Nicole Rodriguez. All right, Nicole. Did you, oh, so yeah, I was just saying that um, mine had to do with sometimes um, studying, right? Where I have like two major goals. One, to make sure that I still work out and keep that in my life while I'm going to grad school because that's just important to me. And then sometimes when I have to study and I see something that's really difficult, I'm like, well, I gotta go for that run now. You know, mm. <laughs> so it's, you know, it's like, okay, I understand that I have to keep my word to myself on both things, but also keeping in mind, like just because something looks difficult and I know that it's gonna take that extra time, my run can wait and doing the extra hour of homework will probably go much longer or, or take me much further. So, yeah. Yeah. so rather than running, literally running away from a problem, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I'm going to, yeah. you know, just. Uh, okay. So of course, it. you know, the, the, I, and I think this is, this is probably, uh, probably accurate for you in all areas of life. You are um, going for the hard stuff, right? You're somebody that picks the hard stuff, so you're picking the hard one to do, which is your word to yourself. So what would that look like? Like, I'm you, okay? I'm you, and you're you, but of course, you know, you've got to talk to yourself, and we've got to do it on online, so I'm you. What is it, like, what does it look like to honor your word with yourself in this, this era? This, what, would, what would you be saying to yourself? It's like a pep talk. Like, like you know what the right thing to do is. Like, don't, you know you know what it is and so it's it's more like firing myself up and just being like you know oh, oh like, ah, now it's going too fast here I'm, I'm, I'm showing you this is what you do how to honor your word ready um are you're so you're either gonna do it mm -hmm. or or you're not so let's say you didn't 
right? Let's say yeah. tomorrow comes and you didn't. Mm -hmm. So talk to me as you, right? Yeah. Fess up. <laughs> All right. So do, do, do that. So. Got it. So what you're, you're saying to do that right now? Um, yeah. Got it. So, so you're saying if I didn't do it, like, okay, Nicole, you went for that run. Yep. And you, you didn't study for the extra hour knowing that you have a, a quiz. Mm -hmm. um, that means that today's run isn't happening and you're spending the extra time. You need yeah. to do what it is you need to do to, to get that grade that you want to get because no one's going to get it for me. Yep. There it is. Um, and um, hey, what's the apology you could make to yourself? it's okay you're human and I know you're scared of math <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and and you know like um you see when you're out of integrity with yourself like it's just it doesn't feel like it feels awful yeah right and you run from it and, and you've done that to yourself so you could you know like you could say you know what like I apologize for like putting you in this position me mm -hmm. right. um, I'll let you know you got two minutes all right. So, I mean, that's it. We, we just demonstrated it, right? Okay. So that, that's, that's what it looks like, right? Or if you're late or you haven't done something with somebody, take a picture of that. That's how you honor your word and restore integrity, okay? And the thing I'll leave you with, right, is this. Integrity is a mountain with no top. You have to learn to love the climb, right? As your game gets bigger, integrity is going to go out. It just is. That doesn't mean you stop playing big games. It just means you got to clean it up, right? And you're never in 100% integrity. Never. No one is, right? Doesn't mean you, you don't keep climbing that mountain. You know why? Because the view is a whole lot nicer from up there than it is down here, wherever you get to on that mountain. So... Um, that's, that's, you wouldn't bring us home, Dylan? No, just thanks everyone. I know in, in real life we could hang out and shake hands and I know this is real life. In physical non-distancing yeah. life, we could hang out and shake hands. So we, we were happy to stay and, and address anything. I know there were a couple questions, um, but, but officially we will complete at 7.30 as we promised. We're really honored that you gifted us with your listening and that you took this on like an opportunity for your own growth and development. And, uh, and we hope to see all of you and, and some more new faces on, on June 16th. So with that, and, and Nicole, thank you. Yes. Thank you for, you made a difference for people today. Thank you. No problem. Right. So we, we're officially complete. And then we can also, you know, if anybody wants to hang out for a few minutes, I'm happy to be here. If you have questions. Um, um, I think um, there's one hand, um, Jayathe Raja. Yeah. Actually, I was just going to tell this. This is for Nicole. I was going to text her directly, but I've been through this journey, uh, Nicole. So I've also, I didn't do my math. It's been a long back gap for me. Yeah. Totally worth it. The UC, UCLA extension, sorry, the UC Berkeley extension math course. There's some other questions on that. And I think it, it's a good refresher for our MBA. All new topics for me, but I, I somehow made it. I did it. Got a lot of, I got mostly A's. So you can do it, Nicole. Definitely. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, I was doing fine until we hit calculus and I was like, oh my God, it's another language. Like literally. Um, but that's a context. Right? That's <laughs> yeah. just a context. Yeah. Yeah. For you sure. could create another one. Turns out. I'm going to work on that. <laughs> All right. Let, let us know how it goes. Okay. <laughs> and we have another hand, Kyle. Okay, please. 